Okay, we're going to be discussing chapter two this evening, and uh, as is pretty normal for me when I do these uh, PowerPoints, I'm not going to be talking over every slide. Um, I, I'm hitting highlights that I think are important. Uh, these are our learning objectives for the chapter, which you can read for yourself. They're also reiterated in the course shell. There's a couple of uh, video cases, and they actually don't exactly match up with these, but I do have a video case uh, embedded a little farther down in our unit folder where we'll be looking uh, briefly at this uh, business here, and I think it's kind of an interesting set of videos to look at. All right, let's, uh, let's go into this um, first set of slides here, and, and this is actually related directly to the initial case study in the chapter, and if you read the book, you'll know what I'm talking about. But I, I do want to look at just very briefly at kind of what they did here. So I want you to notice this and for a couple of reasons, right? Not, not because necessarily this is the most important case in the world, but we are going to work towards in this class developing what we call system solution for hopefully a real world business problem that we can solve with information technology and information systems. And that's exactly why they're showing you these things here. So they're, they're, they're giving you the scenario that says, the problem is they had outdated static technology and they were geographically dispersed. And how did they fix that? They basically changed the way they did things. They really put in uh, systems to help share information, to collaborate, and really led to a change in organizational culture. And I've been kind of watching the organizational world, both from internally and externally, over a long period of time. And for a while, I moved away from these like big organizational environments to my own business environment where I had none of that. Wow, that was really strange, right? And then when I got back into teaching and stuff, I, I got pulled back in, you know, kind of like the mafia thing, right? They pulled me back in. Um, and it, yeah, and you had to deal with all these things. And what's fascinating is they get down to the point where they tell you which products they're using to solve some of this. What's, what's fascinating is this organization, instead of focusing on the Google platform like a lot of companies have moved to lately, is they focused on the Microsoft platform. And Microsoft has a whole bunch of tools. So their big products are Office 365 and SharePoint. And if you buy those products in the cloud, they kind of inter interact with each other. What's fascinating is I happen to have a SharePoint implementation loaded on their servers in the next room, and both for the data analytics class and for this class, I plan to bring a little bit of that in so we can look at it uh, and play with it. Um, Yammer, have you guys ever heard of that? That is like kind of like the Hangouts for Office 365. It's kind of a chat thing, and I don't know too many companies that use it, but I, I have heard really positive things about it. And Jill, you mentioned a product earlier at your workplace that's a yeah. big Microsoft product. Teams. Teams. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but now on consumer machines, mm -hmm. you boot up and sometimes they have a Teams window. And the only way to get rid of it is to actually click through and then you got to like load it up and then tell it not to start with Windows. But they're telling you something. You guys know how Teams works. You know what the point of it is. So, let me, let me demonstrate a different product for you to kind of show you what that is. So I'll just bring up a tab in the browser. And here's a really popular website and tool that programmers and IT people use to do collaborative work to create code. It's called Slack. Mm -hmm. And Teams um, is in a really strong effort to try to knock Slack off the top of the hill. So Slack is free, you don't have to pay for it. You get some advanced features if you do. Um, and I think, I think basically the paid version, all it does is you, you form basically these like threaded conversations. Um, so like if we're working on code together, we might have several, we have a group and then we have several threads that we read through and you post to it and you can get notifications. And the beautiful thing about it is if you have some code, you can share the code in the environment too and then the windows are designed so if you drop Java code in, it color codes for it, you know, and it, it's, it's some pretty neat stuff. Um, and so a lot of people that do collaborative work in IT, especially in programming, tend to use Slack as a tool to collaborate. And Microsoft is seeing this and goes, oh my God, we're missing out on something, so they, they did Teams. And, 
Teams is a much more robust product because it integrates into Office 365 and SharePoint and has high-end features that go with it, including high-end video chat and things that Slack does not do. So, and I think it's fascinating. Now, don't quote me on this, but I think Slack just got bought out. I guess we bought them out. Microsoft? Yeah. So they're really trying, they're making these really strong moves. And why Slack again? For the same reason they bought LinkedIn. It's information. For the same reason they bought GitHub. They're buying up the open source, source world is what they're doing. So I, I think it's a kind of cool and kind of scary all at the same time. Um, and this is really taking a lot of time to load up. You must have like a ton of JavaScript in here or something. Uh, but going into the workspace is a little cumbersome. But if you ever take one of my programming classes, sometimes I re recommend to students, hey, you can form a Slack group and talk to each other and share information. And one of the things that we've seen at, uh, for example, some of the other technical colleges in our system is they actually provide a paid version of Slack to the students because the instructors love it because if there's a question that a student has, somebody will post in, let's say, the uh, ASP.net group and, hey, how do I, and the students answer the questions and the instructors don't have to. The, the only difference between the paid and the unpaid version is the paid version keeps all the messages, the unpaid version, after 10,000 messages, it starts to delete. And for some, that's not a, uh, not a bad thing. But the other technical colleges told us at a meeting that it got so busy with their Slack sites that they had to buy it, because content was deleting too fast. Mm -hmm. So I find that fascinating. We'll see how Teams does in the long run, uh, but they're really pushing hard to get us to work in that environment. So uh, the, I think the integrated um, tools that come with it are what, gonna, what are gonna push it to the next level. All right, let's, let's move on to the next slide here. Uh, and I'm going down to slide number six, business processes. And the reason I bring this up is, you might not think about this when you're working, right? But I, I had a perspective on business process when I you know, went from like just being an employee to being an owner and having a look at the whole operation of how we do things, right? And even though I wasn't on an enterprise level, I would have to think about a lot of like how we do things. So like, how are we purchasing things? How are we handling our customers, our sales, our transactions? You know, what, what's our method for keeping track of inventory or doing our books? Anything that we would do, any business process. And there's always, um, you know, things that you're doing that can be organized and reviewed and more importantly, optimized to be better for you, your customers, and everybody. You know, you make more money, you make your customers happier. Uh, it's just being smart, basically. So they give an example here of like an order fulfillment process. And this is, I think, from a business perspective, right? So you might have a salesperson, they get an order from somebody, they take the order, they send it off uh, to the business end, and, and accounting does a credit check, do we give them a line of credit or not? Um, and then they send out an invoice, and then whoever does the, you know, the product, they put it together and they ship it. Okay, so that, that's a process, and there's kind of a flow to it. And you could very easily see how every single one of these steps has IT and information systems involved, right? In some businesses, that might not be the case, right? So when I took over our family business, you know, my parents wouldn't even take credit cards, right? There's like an ATM across the street. We take cash, you know, <laughs> and that and that was the thing. So, where do you draw the line, right? We boosted sales by adding credit cards, even though it cost us money to do so, right? Um, but those are the kind of things that we look at. What was the business? Um, it was a Greek import business. We brought in Greek uh, giftwares and food products. We did both wholesale and retail, and then we did like custom assembly of some products. Uh, for like specialty Greek ceremonies, like weddings and things like that. Um, but the, the whole point, um, and this is what I'm trying to talk about, is by putting IT into the mix, if you do it intelligently, you can make things more efficient and better, right? 
one example uh, I think of in that business is my my parents always ship product to people, so they would, hey, I, got, I want I want like you know ten cases of olive oil. Okay, we'll we'll send it on a truck, right, or UPS. Uh, and I took that process from where they used to write in a book for UPS. That was how we did it in the old days. To like, um, we have a laptop. Why don't we load up the software and print out the shipping labels? You know, it's a lot easier. Um, and so we did that, and it really kind of helped things. It also gave us the ability to look at all of our orders, you know, and track them electronically. Not, I wouldn't have to call the 800 number and punch in a code. I just hit a button on the screen. Yep, it's in transit. Oh, no, it's delivered. Um, so it helps uh, in many different ways. The, the other thing that I think is pretty interesting is this. Depending on what level of an organization you operate at, you have access to different levels of information. And that's one of the things that you see here quite a bit. That certain you know, IT systems are not really designated for all users. So if you're a cashier, I mean, what do you need to know aside from the scanner and how to make change in the process of you know, the sale? You don't. A manager would have access to much higher level systems and would want much more aggregated information on the back end, maybe even in such a simplistic form, they can just look at it and go, good, bad, <laughs> and make a decision, hopefully. Um, so they, they give an example here of a, a TPS, and what that stands for, by the way, is a transaction processing system. And so uh, in this case, they're uh, attaching this to uh, the payroll, right? And you know, the funny thing is, is um, like I get paid every two weeks on a Friday. By Tuesday or Wednesday of the preceding, you know, pay, you know, when it hits your bank, I can see what I'm going to make before it even hits the bank, you know, because they've already got the checks written or whatever. Um, and I was doing that today, but it's very much like this. So, like, when I, I looked at this, and the thing that stuck out to me is online queries. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, right. I was just looking at my pay stub today, right? And, be, and what's really cool is because it's the third pay period in January that I'm getting paid, they don't pull any of my stuff out, you know, none of my deductions, so not, like no dental, medical, all that stuff, because the first two, they, they can only do it twice a month. So I get a little bit larger paycheck. So that happens a couple times a year. And so I look at stuff like that and I go, oh, hey, I got a couple hundred extra bucks. Let's go out and uh, buy food for the kids. <laughs> you guys thought I was going to say something else, right? Um, but they kind of continue on this whole uh, concept here and they talk about different types of systems. So you're going to see you know, management information systems. And that's the topic of this course, right? But that's one aspect, really. We kind of try to lump all of it into that title, but it really is um, a, a different thing. So they have decision support systems, executive support systems, and it's all different granular levels of information depending on what those individuals need to see to make decisions. All right. Um, when, we, when we talk about MIS systems, they typically tend to serve what we call middle management. And people are like, what the heck is middle management, right? Well, it's not the, the president and the, and the VPs, and it's not uh, maybe your supervisor on the floor. It's all those other people in between that you don't really know what they do, okay? And, but a lot of those people need information in order to do their jobs. Gateway has a bunch of those people. Most of them are called directors of something or other, or managers. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because culturally, the people like us who do like the nitty gritty work of teaching or office work, look at those people like, what do they really do, you know? But they do something, right? Um, and, you know, there's, there's not really much of a point here when you're looking at the middle management level of it where they're necessarily manipulating the data and doing stuff like that, but they're often just looking at the output of the systems to make decisions, and usually quickly and on the fly. So the people that are putting the systems together and providing the information are in this kind of unique role of delivering it in a way where they can actually kind of steer the ship a little bit. This is kind of weird, right? Because if I prevent cer present certain information to my boss and say, hey, this is what it says, and he just believes me, he's going to make a decision based upon what I said, but maybe the data really says something else. And I think that's a kind of a fascinating um, thought. So they give a couple of examples here, so you can do like order processing or whatever. Um, but ultimately, the data gets aggregated and then put into reports, and then the managers look at it and make decisions. 
and, it, and it's kind of a, almost a frustrating process in a sense, because when you're looking at data from a really high level, sometimes you don't appreciate how it got there, and the, the critical aspect of analyzing it is sometimes lost. Because if I was to look at, uh, like say, performance reports for our programs here at Gateway, there's very detailed, granular information, like how many graduates we have, how many are satisfied, how many got jobs, what their pay rate is, we get all that data, right? But it fluctuates, and then you're like, why did it fluctuate? Is it because of something we did? Is it the marketplace? Is it, you know, the people they just happened to ask? Did you catch them on a bad day? You can't always get data from everybody, so that, that's another example. So they kind of give all these, like, high-level examples. So, like, a manager might see something like this, right? Say, okay, oh, so with the carpet cleaners, these were our sales, uh, these were our actual sales, these were our targets. Uh, anything above one is good, anything below is not. Uh, better fire the guy up in the Northeast or better light a fire under, you know, whatever and get him motivated um, or whatever the case may be. But little do you realize maybe, maybe their factory caught on fire. Maybe that's why sales are down. Maybe they didn't do anything wrong. You know, so sometimes the high level data can be kind of interesting. They have these other systems called decision support systems, which I think are fascinating. Um, and I mean, you guys can read up on this as well. Um, but often what these are pulling in is not just internal data, but sometimes external data as well. And um, so like market forces. So for example, um, they take a look at this uh, thing here. So they look at, all right, what are our fuel consumption and uh, what does it cost to ship something or whatever. Um, but sometimes this stuff is not controlled by you, right? So we went to Starbucks today and got our coffee, and we always get the same thing. And normally it's $11.56 for the two coffees. Outrageous, I know. But <laughs> today it was $11.99. We're like, what, the price of like milk go up? You, you know what I mean? And it's like, well, Starbucks will do that. And so I'm curious, the next time I go to a different Starbucks, so there's an external forcer that we have no control over but that information is still important because maybe next time I won't get the you know the fufu latte caramel whatever I'll just get coffee black thank you which I often do anyhow so all right so they have uh, executive support systems and the higher up the chain that you're going the more aggregated the uh, the information becomes this is my general rule of thumb all right skipping down a little bit all right Here's where we kind of get a little bit more into the high level system. So when we talk about the enterprise, we are not talking about, you know, the mom and pop shop on the street like what I was running, right? We are talking organizations that typically have a minimum of several hundred employees, if not thousands, right? Gateway is a great example. A gateway I would call an enterprise. We have a complex network. We have lots of people doing lots of different roles, running lots of different systems, working with lots of different uh, information. The, in those types of environments, they have like basically these four large types of enterprise systems that they typically deal with. So one is called enterprise systems. Okay, so that, that's pretty vague, right? But that typically will encompass things like ERP systems. So an ERP system might be very holistic to an organization. Here at Gateway, we have a couple. One of them handles all of our scheduling for our rooms, the course scheduling, when the courses are offered, who's assigned to them, blah, 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 and it kind of goes on and on and on, right? Uh, which we pull our class rosters from it, it ties into web advisors, so when you're planning out your courses, how does it know which courses are offered? Because it pulls it from the system. It's huge, huge database, basically, is what it is. Um, if you worked in, a, in an organization where you had supply chains so for manufacturing or production or sales or something like that, that's a big area. In fact, we just launched a new degree this fall. Oh, actually, excuse me, last fall, uh, that specifically is tailored toward supply chain management. We'll talk about this a little more. There's also CRM systems, and you can see customer relationship management. So if you're into sales, uh, very often you have systems like this that kind of aggregate all your sales information. Then there's knowledge management systems, which basically aggregate all the information that you've gathered for easy retrieval. So why is it, you know, that let's say you can put in a support ticket or talk to a chat bot and get a response to a question because it's in that database. So you gather up information, you aggregate it and you store it, and that's knowledge management. You know, they kind of have this little graphic here too that shows how they kind of 
uh, interrelate and where they sit relative to different disciplines. I'm not too worried about that, I suppose. But when you start to break these down into what each one of these do, and you can read it from the chapter yourself, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, but this is a much higher level thing. And, and what I like about this is a, a big enterprise system can actually also have plugins, and this is the fascinating part of it, that allow you to perform all the other major systems too. So, for example, an enterprise system might encompass a piece of software like SAP. Have you guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. All right. And, and that's because you're in that sort of environment, Jill, where you're working, and that's like a big enterprise system. But the enterprise system, like SAP, has plugins for HR, sales, inventory, uh, knowledge management, all the stuff that this does, you can buy plugins and add it to that one system and it does the whole thing. Like, wow. And it's on one database. Um, very uh, interesting. Um, it tends to manage a lot of like the day-to-day -day type of stuff that are operational things. And then we go, go to supply chain management. And this is really more about the nitty gritty of moving stuff around. Now, the reason we added this degree here at Gateway was because we had Foxconn, right? Point to the thing on the wall here, mm -hmm. saying that, hey, we have, we need people that know how to do supply chain management. And it's like, well, we teach a little bit of that. No, no, we need people that are specialized. Because mm -hmm. Foxconn, in order to manufacture something efficiently, you know, let's say they, they want to build a TV set and you get into creative parts, right? They don't just want the creative parts. They want the creative parts so that's all ready for their robots to pick it up and put it in the production line without having to futz with it. They don't want somebody to have to take it out of the box and unpack it and then straighten it out and put it on a thing and then put it on a platform and then send it down the line and then have the robot do it. That's a lot of wasted time. So if I can get my supplier to provide the product in just the way my robots need it, hey, that we're gonna do some business, right? So it, it's simple little things like that. Uh, CRM systems, of course, are, are kind of geared towards these activities, sales and marketing and uh, dealing with customers. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the chatbot systems that you even interact with directly tie to the CRM systems and report back. Or another CRM activity, very common in IT, is ticketing systems for problems, right? Most all tie back as well. Knowledge management, um, really it's exactly what it sounds like. It's kind of like aggregating what you know and putting it in one spot so you can retrieve it. It's kind of interesting that this kind of became a thing because when you think about it, in a lot of companies, you would often get these individuals who become gurus. This person knows everything about this company and they, they've been here for 50 years and no wonder, you know, then that person dies and all the knowledge is lost. Well, why don't you write it down? And so this is kind of like the electronic equivalent of that. So you gather up all this knowledge and information, so what do you do with it? You should store it and you should put it in a system where it can be retrieved dynamically, electronically, and maybe everybody can have access to it. I mean, how silly is it that like you guys get like a student handbook and then it's only printed on paper and then you lose it? And it's like, well look at the policy in your student handbook. Well, I don't have one. Well, let's put it online. Okay, simple solution. But that's a primitive form or example of that. Why not, right? Shouldn't be a, a, a mystery. We, we look also at different ways to communicate with both our you know, internal and external customers. And like here at Gateway, when I go to the Gateway website and log in, like you guys do too, and actually now that I think about it, you log into my Gateway. And the moment you're in my Gateway, you have access to stuff that you can't otherwise access if you're not logged in. And employees often have that too. Those are called intranets. Um, doesn't mean you can't access it from outside on the internet, it just means that you're in, you're in the company network. Mm -hmm. And then extranets is where you kind of give that kind of access to people that you work with. So in this case, you might give a supplier access to your network so they can directly upload an order or provide inventory. That's really kind of a good example. Things are moving, obviously, everything's becoming uh, digitized and every aspect of our society is kind of buying in. And you know, e-business has been around for a while. Um, and notice how that's different than commerce, though. E-business doesn't mean you're bu necessarily buying and selling stuff. It's just you're, you're interacting electronically instead of maybe uh, the old-fashioned way, pencil and paper or phone call. Um, 
but the government's in the game too, right? So, you know, of course, I get paid Friday the 31st. What's, what happens on the 31st, Jill? That's where we pay our property taxes, <laughs> right? Okay, so, I'm yeah. really close to my mortgage, so. Yeah, you know what? I, I, and you know what, my main house, that's true for me too. It, mm -hmm. It's automatically paid by the mortgage, but I have another house where I have to what, go to City Hall and pay, right? So that, that's kind of one of those things. But the you government, have to go? well, that's my point. In the old days, I'd have to go stand in line at City Hall oh. with everybody else and like wait to get to the cashier so they could stamp it and you could prove it was paid, right? Uh, and then, you know, like their next step up was like, we have a Dropbox, <laughs> you drop your check. Or hey, you could mail it, right? Uh, but now they actually have a system online that we can go to and pay it. And I'm very excited for it. Um, but the reason they, they did not do that for a long time is this. They won't take credit cards. Why? Because they lose like three to four to five percent. That's too much money when they're trying to run the whole city off of it and they're already short on dollars. And so they have other mechanisms. So now they have like direct bank transfers where the fees are really small and it makes interest for them uh, to do it. Um, the other interesting aspect of that is all this collaboration stuff that we were uh, just talking about. Whether you realize or not, anything you do out in the world, you're interacting with people, right? And you have to work with people in organizations like this to do work. Um, and society is definitely changing, and, and this is kind of like one of the grand topics of the, the chapter here, is this what we call the social networking infiltrating the professional world. But the one example that we, I think we talked about a little bit is LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm hoping that all of you, at least by the time you finish school and you're ready to go out to work, is you have yourself a LinkedIn profile. And I had kind of a funny conversation with my son about this, where he said to me, Dad, I have a LinkedIn profile. I haven't gotten any jobs yet. But well, hold on a second. You think that because you put a profile out there, you're going to get a job? Do you really think that's how it works? And I'm like, you have to connect to people. You should connect to your teachers, your friends, anybody that you've had interactions with, and then put like some information out there about yourself, what your skills are, and then maybe you'll find a job. Maybe, right? Um, but that's that's one of those networks that kind of fits into that uh, category. Um, the the weird thing about the collaborative aspect of using technology in a professional environment is. I was kind of floored when I came here to Gateway because they were so collaborative when I got in, this is like six years ago, right? They were steeped in it. And I came from other institutions where I was teaching, where they totally were not. You were lucky to get an email from somebody in your organization. You know, you have a meeting once in a while. But here at Gateway, it's like, man, the conversations are flying constantly. Email chains, hangouts, whatever. And um, I, I have like fond recollections of like my first video chats. It's like, hey, we're having a meeting. I'm like, all right, I'll meet you in Kenosha. Oh, you don't have to drive down. You can just hop on at home. You just I'm like, oh, oh, cool. <laughs> I'm like, hey, this, this works for me. So I can just sit there in my pajamas and, and do my thing and um, be, be a productive employee. And in fact, you know, I'm on campus a lot now because of my chair duties, but the truth is much of my teaching is online, right? I can do it just as effectively from home. Now, whether or not you can work from home is a whole separate thing, right? So a lot of people have that. I want a job where I can work from home. And then they start to do it and they're like, oh my God, I can't work from home because the dog's barking, the kids are asking for something, you know, somebody's knocking on the door, you know, the, the toilet broke or whatever, and, and your mind's not at it. And, and I, I will tell you that I, I'm kind of on the fence with that. So sometimes I can work from home just fine, but it tends to be when everybody else is away. <laughs> You know, so that, that's kind of, a, I think, an interesting aspect of it as well. Um, all right, so let's talk about the kind of tools that we use to, to collaborate. So we've talked about a couple. So email and instant messaging, I think those are the most prevalent, clearly, right? Gateway is a very heavily email-driven organization. I think I probably spend an average of an hour or two each day plowing through emails, sometimes more. And then, like I had yesterday, I had one of these situations where we have a situation going on and people are angry and there's all these meetings and things are flying. And I, was, I just stood back and let the fireworks fly 
And then when it was all kind of settled, I'm like, okay, well, here's kind of what the lay of the land is, folks. You guys are letting all your emotions out there to the point where my boss is saying, was, was he drunk when he wrote this? And I kid you not, right? That was yeah. one of the comments my boss said. And then he also thanked me for just sitting back and watching and then stepping in and just kind of speaking the truth about it. And it's a really a hard thing to do when emotions fly. And you would hope in a professional environment that's not the case. But you've got to be really careful with email, folks. If you don't take the time to really look at what you're typing, you're doing yourself and your coworkers a disservice. Because so many people treat emails like text messages. Wrong. Full complete sentences, say exactly what you mean, read, reread, reread again, edit, 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 then hit send, and then maybe think about it twice before you even hit that button. Sending email can sometimes be a little stressful. <laughs> it is. You know, and, and, I, and I'll tell you what, that when I finally did send my response yesterday, it took me about an hour to type it. And then after I typed it, I let it sit for another hour, came back and looked at it, I'm like, you know what, it's good, send. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to be hot-headed about it, you know? Um, and that's one of the advantages of email. But it's also one of the disadvantages because I could have probably sat in the room with the same people and delivered that message in like two minutes. Mm -hmm. I see that a lot at work where sometimes I'm just like, you know, 30 seconds on the phone fixes versus right. Emails, yeah. You know, Jill, and I, I think exactly like you, and it's funny because my boss thinks the same way. Mm -hmm. And so I had him step into a classroom once, and I was actually coaching the students on writing an email to a client for a web project. He said, hi, this is great that you're doing this, but you got like five paragraphs. Why don't you just pick up the phone and call him? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. How much, like, how much, I'm like, thanks, Ray. Thanks a lot for doing that to me. But you know, he was totally right. And, I, and I'm, I, I, I do at times tire of this whole mindset that we have to spend so much time thinking about what we're trying to communicate. But it's, not that it's not important, but in many cases you can more effectively deliver it. I could take all the stuff I'm saying here in class. I mean, you guys can read a chapter for yourself, right? But my goal isn't to reread the chapter. My goal is to fill in the blanks and have you think about what it's really saying. And I'm hoping open your mind to like what the future might be or what you could do with it. Now, some of the other stuff that they have on this slide I think is fascinating. All right. So first of all, what is a wiki? What does the word wiki mean? Well, of course, everybody's gonna say, well, there's Wikipedia. Yeah. All right. So what's so special about Wikipedia? Anybody can contribute. Hypothetically. Yeah. Right. And in the old days when they first released Wikipedia, it wasn't hard to go in there. And you can, oh, well, I don't like what this says. You just type in your own stuff. But now even Wikipedia has gotten to the point where they qualify the content and they have moderators of certain areas that look at it. And then every once in a while you'll land in an article that'll say, this section has some superfluous content and needs more references to support it. And I, I think that's wonderful. But yeah, what Wiki, Wiki is to do things, the word technically, and I think we could Google this. And you know what, maybe I shouldn't even speak it. Let's just see what Google says. What is a wiki? Right. Uh, a wiki is a knowledge base website on which users collaboratively modify and structure content directly from a web browser. In a typical wiki, text is written using zip for, okay, so they have a markup language that they use. Um, and yeah, so, that, so it's interesting that the uh, you know, official definition of it is that. But if you change this and say, what does wiki mean, it's a little different. Isn't I think this is, well, actually, or, or is it? Okay, well, apparently, I guess this is what it means now. <laughs> um, and I'm trying to think, I'm try what I'm trying to do is find Okay, here it is. Because in the old days when you look it up, this is what you would get. It says the term wiki comes from the Hawaiian, Hawaiian phrase, wiki wiki, which means super fast. So the concept of it is that if people are collaborating to put together content, it's gonna, be, it's gonna develop faster. And there are organizations that allow people to multiply co collaborate on certain contents. And, and this is where 
I think the line blurs. So we think of wiki, when we think of wikis, we think of a formalized internet structure like Wikipedia. And actually, you can start websites that do the same thing. Even Blackboard's got a wiki tool built into it. And every once in a while, I kind of pull it out with students. Um, but in terms of how we work internally as an organization, when we have meetings, sometimes we're remote, and we're all looking at the same spreadsheet. We're all looking at the same document, and we're collaboratively editing it at the same time. And to me, that's still a wiki, right? And that happens a lot in our organizations. So we don't have to share screens even. We can just be on the phone. Are you in the spreadsheet? Yes, I am. We just edit the same thing. We get a lot of work done that way. And when you are working with people, and I feel really fortunate because, of course, all us IT people are totally in tune to this, right? We'll sit there. It's like, okay, I'll work on this part. You work on that part. Well, I'll work on this part. And we're done. You know, we're, we just plow through it because everybody's razor sharp with the tools. And if you get to work with people like that, man, it is really satisfying. Um, and it really shows the power of it. Because a document that might have taken me and my, myself hours to complete, we just completed in 15 minutes because I had 10 people working on it at the same time. And, and, it's, and it's probably better. So that, that's kind of the power of it. Um, the other uh, interesting thing is this one, virtual worlds. What the hell do they mean by that? And I, Jack, you were talking about playing civilization. Now that's not quite a virtual world, right? Um, but there are, like at least from the social media standpoint, there's environments, and I'm, I'm just gonna name one off the top of my head, like Second Life, right? You guys ever hear that one? Uh, like I've known people that have like found their spouse on Second Life. I'm like, wow, that's pretty weird, right? Um, now, I'm not sure how I, I've seen that happen in a workplace like this, but I, I wonder, will we get to that point where we have kind of like a pseudo-existent world mm -hmm. that we actually do work in? Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm really curious about that one, you know? And when you think of virtual worlds, you, you, you can extend it to like environments like Minecraft, which is a game, right? And what do pe people do inside of Minecraft? Well, they build stuff and the zombies attack things and whatever. But people also interact. Now, I'm not seeing where work gets done there yet, but we'll see in the future. We'll see in the future. Um, and then you look at these uh, tools here. And I know I'm spending a lot of time on this slide, but it is with intent. And so, um, so virtual meeting systems, so telepresence. So anything where you do video conferencing. A lot of our classrooms here, this isn't one of them, where we have uh, televideo systems. And a lot of those systems don't work over IP networks, they actually go over phone networks, a little bit different. Uh, yeah, we work with cloud services, so like doing Google Docs or whatever. But then we, work, we move on to these tools. And, and this is one that I'm, I'm pointing out, and then IBM Notes, which was previously Lotus Notes, um, and related to another product called GroupWise, which were these really revolutionary products that came out a really, really long time ago. So Lotus Notes, which was the precursor to IBM Notes, was this really strange database-driven email, content sharing, internet. Like they were just like figuring out how to put computers together and they're doing this like platform and nobody could figure out why do we need this, right? They didn't even know what it was, right? And, but the concept has stuck around, and really the, the Google app suite that we work now is really kind of uh, the modern day personification of it, where we have all these different applications that work together on one platform, that are all tied together, that allow you to connect to your organization, your friends, whatever. Uh, Microsoft SharePoint is another one of those products, and because we teach that here at uh, Gateway, I do plan on uh, showing you that environment and kind of goofing around with it a little bit in this class. Jill, you've already had some SharePoint, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And a lot of these platforms have built right into them. Like SharePoint has the ability to do, you know, collaboration right, right inside the environment, depending on which construct you choose. And I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and then, of course, we have a lot of enterprise social networking tools like the ones they were talking about in the chapter and they got into specifics with it in the case studies, uh, for example. Uh, just about done here, folks. Um, and, and I thought this was kind of an, uh, 
an interesting slide because they, they talk about um, like when you might actually use certain collaboration tools. Like we think about email, and here at Gateway, email is prob probably our primary communication mechanism. But it is an asynchronous technology. It always is interesting that if you're working during the business day and you pop off an email, and the people that, you know, I'll call it office drones, right, that are always at their desks, always on their computers doing their work, you get an instant response almost, right? Almost, almost as fast as like a, a text message. And then you have like the other aspect, and instructors often fall into this, right, because we're not always at our computers. Sometimes we're teaching or whatever, and you get a message, and it takes days. You can't, you're not communicating synchronously. And, and this is really kind of a, you know, kind of a, a chart that shows you like where you fit, depending on the technology that you're using. Um, in terms of, you know, looking at how we get like job positions or roles within a company and how they fit into information systems, you often see some of these acronyms. So like here at Gateway, I think we have a CIO and a CTO, right, and they have different functional jobs. You think about like, what's a CIO? Chief Information Officer is different than a Chief Technology Officer. Right, you're dealing with two different systems, really. Um, and, you know, there's, there's all these acronyms. Some organizations have all of them, some of them have none of them. Uh, that, or they just call them completely different things. Um, but you see that you have people way at the top of the chain that tend to have those roles usually at like VP level or above. Uh, and then we have the people like us, you know, right, that fit in the next kind of three bullets, right? We, we're analysts, programmers, or whatever, and then you have ultimately the users that are using uh, all the different systems. Another thing that we don't want to forget about is the fact that typically large organizations will set up like rules, regulations, policies for dealing with these things. Now one thing I, I find really fascinating is with this weird email chain that was going around yesterday. Basically, a group, this one group of people was having an issue with a certain individual, right? Where they're running up, up to management and everything. And they're calling them out by name, right? They're saying, so-and-so is a blah, 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 and you know, whatever, you know? And when I, part of my response was, okay, well, hold on a second. I'm not naming the guy, but I'm just gonna use his initials because I don't know if they realize this, but that every communication we have here at Gateway, we're a government agency, is public record. So if you guys wanted, you could put in a Freedom of Information Act request to find out all the communications that are related to you. I wanna know what my teacher said about me. And you know what? I think about that. I don't think a lot of other people do. And I know the person who initiated it, and that's what my, my boss said, was this person drunk when they wrote the email? Right? Because it, it didn't seem like he was really thinking really clearly about what he was saying when he was first blurting out the, the complaints. Whether the complaints are valid or not, but it's like people get hot-headed and don't think. But that is a very real aspect. So if you go to a private company, you're not going to get that information. However, people that run that company, you think about this, if you work for a company, does that company have the right to look at your emails? Yeah. Well, of course they do. It's their email system, right? Do they have a right to look at your your files? Or what, uh, or if you're Facebooking while you're working or you're downloading music while you're working? Of course they do. So there's this ethical thing. And that's why I think one of the areas we're moving into a, a chapter or two from now is to talk about some of the security and privacy things. But those are things that you guys need to kind of look at. Some organizations have very, um, specific policies, like Gateway has a policy that if you send me an email, I'm supposed to respond within 48 business hours. I think that's pretty reasonable, right? If you don't get a response in two days, well, yeah, uh, I mean, what's the deal? Please respond. Um, and I, I find that the one nice thing is that Google added to their Gmail recently, at least on the enterprise level, I don't know if it happens on the personal level, if there's an email and I forgot to respond to it, or it seems like I was kind of hanging on it, it moves it up my email chain and puts a little thing that says, um, last looked at like four days ago, do you want to respond? You forgot about this? I'm like, oh, hey, thank you, Google. 
Uh, so I think that's kind of a, a interesting thing. All right, that's going to cap the lecture. Uh, let's take a break and we'll come back and uh, finish it.